all in our hands. Has been paid for by the WZWA Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the WZWA fucking network. I'm California. This is Juicy Boy, and this is our review show here of GCW Tournament of Survival 7. Juicy Boy, how the fuck are you doing, bro? I'm doing fucking great. What a fucking show we just watched. Let's get into it. Yeah, fuck yeah, cunt. Uh, We start the show. Nick Gage opens the show, cuts a promo. Passion from the fans. They're all happy to see Nick, and uh, he pops in uh, on commentary here and there throughout the show. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Yeah, uh, yeah, very nice. Let's get, on with yeah. the, let's get on the fucking tournament, bro, okay? Yeah. Uh, tournament of Survival 7, the first one that you and I have ever seen from, from you know, my 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 knowledge anyway. I, I don't believe you've seen one, have you? Not, nah, I haven't seen the GCW version of a death match. Right, like, okay, well, the these, first... Yeah. The first match of Tournament of Survival 7, bro, was Hoodfoot taking on Rina Yamashita. And I believe you cracked a Sheeta after finding out that a, a female was going to be in this tournament, Juicy Boy. Your thoughts on the match and, and what was so upsetting to you about uh, Rina's inclusion? You don't do intergender matches, you know. I'm, I'm all for fucking a mixed tag match. You know, I'm all for a a a deathmatch tournament featuring female competitors and a deathmatch tournament featuring male competitors. Maybe even as a novelty, one of the smaller male competitors going up against a female competitor uh, in a one-on-one match if it's done in the right way. As a general rule, I hate, hate, hate intergender matches, especially where there's a huge size disparity. Now. <clears throat> Every time anyone says anything that's perceived to be against the current state of women's wrestling, i.e. men wrestling women in matches, hitting big slams and throws on males, uh, male wrestlers striking and beating the crap out of women in the context of it being a wrestling match. And a lot of the attitude today from a lot of the modern fans is, oh, well, everyone knows it's just a show anyway. So why shouldn't this female character be allowed to be shown to be equal in strength and ability to this male character? I'll tell you why. Because no other sport in the fucking world allows a mixture of intergender competitors unless we're talking about curling or something like that that doesn't (laughs) need weight classes. Uh, So before anyone out there wants to be like, oh, well, fuck, they're tougher than you. They're better in the ring than you could ever do. I know that. I know that, like, you know, this is a a tough woman. She'd kick my ass in a fight. Absolutely. She had no chance if it was a real fight against a dude that's like four times her size. Uh, That's why I had against it. I actually thought that the two of them did their best to fucking work together and put on an entertaining match. I was impressed by the finish, uh, you know, her ability to deliver the, the outsider's edge on such a, a big man and his ability to take it. And they both worked well together in that regard. But the idea of booking this match, the idea of treating this match as if it was a fair, completely legitimate match, and then having the female competitor actually win the match, uh, was it goes against everything I believe in as a wrestling fan. I don't really care if people agree with me or not, or if it's me not getting it or whatever. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. Fucking, I don't give a shit. Get this. It sucked. I'm giving it a D minus. And the ring announcer, by the way, you know, needs to wear some kind of jacket over his T-shirt. Like, I get it. He's that, you know, GCW, they don't give a fuck. They're doing like the whole casual thing. He's chill, he's in his jeans, he's got the Cactus Jack shirt. Fine. I think a bomber jacket or a leather jacket for the ring announcer just to distinguish him a little bit more would have been useful because he kind of looked like a fan. Not a great start to this fucking show. Well, uh, just to... Uh, just to... Because what you said about the ring announcer, 
you could see people fanning themselves. It's pretty hot in there. I think maybe he probably wouldn't want to wear a leather jacket. That's just me. Well, you know, don't be a ring and get out of the business if you can't handle it. You know, <laughs> you can't. Too- <laughs> get out of the business now. You can't handle it. That's a Bruce Pritchard <laughs> point about fucking Scott Hall. Dude. That's- <laughs> yeah. uh, so look, yeah, hood foot. Uh, we saw in the XPW King of the Death Match tournament. Uh, you know, that seven hour extravaganza. Um, also <laughs> wanted to point out very nice when I saw how long this was. Oh, three hours. That's all it needs to be, cunt. Three hours. Yep. Well any done. More than that, well done. Three and a half I can put up with, but any more than that, oh boy. Yeah. Bit too and by much. the way, and by the way, that's three hours with there being breaks in between the matches to clean up all the carnage and stuff like that. AEW, you never need a five and a half hour event. No wrestling promotion anywhere in the world needs a five and a half hour event. Three hours, max. JCW did it right here. Yeah, well done. Uh, so I liked some of this stuff in this match. I liked the testicular claw that she mm-hmm. put on hood foot. Um, the, you know, the Kenzans in the head, I always, that makes me feel ill um, in a good way, I suppose. Um, I thought the psychology was right. Uh, she couldn't Irish whip him. Um you know, they were doing things of that nature where she was having a hard time maneuvering this big man around. Um, Love and Hoodfoot go on to the Tower of Tubes. Uh, the best spot of the match was the tube behind her neck. And it was like, it was like the tube was giving her a fucking full Nelson almost. Uh, and he hit a fucking German suplex on her. I thought that should have been the finish. I thought that that was so hectic that there's no way anyone should kick out of that. It was very creative as well. I don't know if anyone's done it before. I am a tourist in the world of watching deathmatch wrestling. So don't, uh, you know, don't send me any mean comments. Uh, but I thought that that was a very good spot and he should have gone over there. Uh, her hitting an edge through the tubes that I popped for it. Cause I was like, I couldn't believe the impact of it. Um, and I know that you were, weren't happy with her going over bro but uh, uh that's against why I, her. I, I, I i wrote down the quote uh, of what you said as you left the room after the match fucking stupid fucking shit fucking crap <laughs> <laughs> clearly flustered couldn't think of what to say just spat out random swear words um i like that the cleanup between matches is very nice and quick by the way just for yep. those playing at home don't know why anyone would be playing at home for that. But uh, okay, next matchup, the second matchup in the tournament of survival. It is Slade taking on the bulldozer, Matt Tremont. I'll run through my short amount of notes very quickly here, bro. Um, favorite spot of the match was the wiffle bats at the beginning uh, when Matt hit Slade with his wiffle bat, which had tacks all around it. The amount that just stuck in Slade's bald skull was fantastic. Um, And I also have to give props to Slade for his um, hard efforts into making sure that he's got a horrible tan line. Um, Some, uh, the sick chair shot to the head from, from Slade on, on Matt Tremont, you know, I know it's bad. I know people say, oh, it's not good. You shouldn't do it. But sometimes I just feel like there's nothing fucking better, bro, than a fucking solid chair shot to the head. It just looks great. Um, instead of them always poking him in the gut, hit him in the back, poke him in the gut, hit him in the back, fuck up. Um, the other thing is, just with the chair shots, I don't think people give a shit how strong the chair actually is. They just like the visual, visual of it hitting the head. Mm. So I agree. Anyway, sorry, go on. It's fine, bro. Uh, gusset plate bats, great visual as Slade mm. dug it into Tremont's head, followed by a light tube rake to the head. Fucking crazy. Uh, Tremont's head yeah. piercing, piercing with blood, bro. Fucking, that, that got me really into it. Uh, and a great finish with Tremont hitting two lazy DVDs on a chair, uh, then hitting him with tubes <laughs> to the head. Yeah. <laughs> and then the third Death Valley driver and the win cunt. I'm glad. And at that point, I wrote, I hope he wins the whole thing. Juicy boy, your thoughts, Slade Tremont. Yeah, I thought this was a pretty entertaining match. I'm going to go ahead and give it a C plus at the outset. And the only thing I really want to say is to add on to your notes there, because I pretty much feel the same way. Um, This thing was a fight. Um, It looked like a fight. It's a great example of how deathmatch wrestling, for people that don't get it, 
they obviously aren't very big historians because throughout time there have been competitions of this nature where people will step into an arena and endure pain, endure suffering to test each other's metal and decide who's the toughest out of all of them. It's a very primal type thing. And I think that's what deathmatch wrestling is about at its core. And I think that's what this match showed off. And just for anyone that doesn't really know what Carl is talking about when he says lazy Death Valley drivers for the the finish of this match, what he means when he says lazy Death Valley drivers was that uh, Tremont would would pick the opponent Mercer up, uh, deliver a a Death Valley driver, but then just not go down with the, the move at all. Um, like he couldn't be bothered taking his own bump for his Death Valley driver maneuver. And then he does that a couple of times, and then you find out he took the bump with it for the the final one. So it went from being a lazy Death Valley driver to now two mini Death Valley drivers before the the (laughs) final exclamation point. I really enjoyed it. This was where I started to get more into the show. Nice work. Excellent, bro. Uh, moving forward, the third match. This is great. It's only it's only eight competitors. You know, I loved yeah, nice. XPW's tournament uh, that they had a, a, a little while ago. Yeah. Sixteen people. It just went on for a too long much, time. man. Eight is nice and concise. If you're gonna have sixteen men, I'd say do it over two days. Um, mm-hmm. Toru Segura uh, takes on Shane Mercer. Uh, I believe we saw Shay Mercer for the XPW King of the Death Deathmatch tournament. That's right. Um, the, he's a very strong uh, individual. What did you think of this matchup here? Kind of a, a mix of styles here: the Japanese style and the the strong um, powerhouse that is Shay Mercer. I liked it. I'm going to go ahead and give it a C minus because there are a few things here that I don't think worked as well as they wanted to, but I. Really thought that both guys did a great job of kind of staying in their characters, portraying their characters, accentuating the strengths, hiding the weaknesses. That's what good performers do in the ring. That's what these guys did. The audience got into this, and which means it was over, which means that people watching in the arena will probably buy a ticket to come back to GCW again to see something like this match again. I particularly enjoyed the... uh, I'm not even sure if it was in this match, so I won't mention it yet, but I think it was this match where we where we saw the the light tubes uh held behind the opponent's back and the the suplex, the suplex delivered. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. yeah. Uh that was a great spot. I really enjoyed that. Props to both guys, even though I could kind of see um, you know, the cooperation to pull it off. I'm going to give it a slight pass because, you know. It's a deathmatch show in front of, in front of three hundred people. You know, this is not a pay per view. They were charging like eighty bucks for everyone to watch. Um, so yeah, not bad. Cool, bro. Yeah, I thought it was a solid start to the match. Uh, the tubes to the head were dime. Uh, great athleticism from Toru uh, with the mm. leap to the top rope, following it up with forearms with tubes uh, and a cannonball, which was fantastic. Uh, great dive to the outside, but then I, I think the spot was supposed to be he was getting caught in the end of getting power bombed by Mercer, and then Mercer kind of chucked him into the chairs in the front row. Kind of a bit of a letdown, really. I think they should have just left it as a being a dive, but that's what they yeah. had planned. Um, yeah, the tubes in the pants with the suplex was ridiculous. Very impressed with Mercer. Uh, very strong. I think I mentioned that in the XPW review. The moon assault and battery, the the fall away slam whilst doing a moonsault off the ropes. That's nuts. That's a great move. Yeah. Uh, the Spanish fly had a lot of uh, ferocity, velocity, whatever you want, whatever the word is. Um, it's nice seeing it and liking seeing it because I feel like I see that move too much these days. <clears throat> AEW. Um, Segura wins uh, with a bit of a letdown because I thought that hula hoop light tube thing was really going to be utilized in a more creative way. But, you know, like maybe the guy's on the top rope and you pop it over the top of him and then you pull him through and then you superplex him. I thought that would have been better with it wrapped around him, but rather than he's just 
in it on his ass and he hits him with a running knee with a fuck he did. I mean, I think in a way, just that the simplicity, the brutality of it, though, you know, like shut up, just glass, <laughs> just glass, <laughs> just nothing but just just glass in the side of his head. Yeah, cool, bro. Uh, let's move forward, man. We, 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 we're doing quite well here. This is the yeah, fourth match yeah. of the fucking tournament, bro. Wildheart fuck Cole yeah. Radrick takes on uh, the deathmatch prince, Drew Parker. Um, here's my notes. I thought Cole looked like he was 14 years old. Um, and I knew as soon as I saw him, I was like, he's going to have to work hard to uh, get my approval. And it's nothing against him. It's just from uh, judging a book by its cover, which is what I did, and I admit that. I judged a book by its cover. I was like, oh, who let him in the tournament? Look at the, look at the size of this guy. Anyway, um, it's a nice cannonball into Parker on the chair with the tubes. Uh, and the way that Cole was dragged on the floor, the blood, like, <laughs> following him was really cool. Um Nice attempt at the 619 into the tubes. Uh, another great spot was that Death Valley driver onto the ladder, but I kind of feel like the rule of one, if someone on the show already does a Death Valley driver, no one else should do a Death Valley driver. You could have done something else, running power slam maybe. I don't fucking know. Um, there was a driver through the tubes between the ladders, which was very nice. And it was kind of at this point where I was like, okay, this this pricks won me over, and so has uh, Drew Parker, who I was also seeing perform for the first time. Solid match. The swanton off the top of the ladder was a very good finish. Juicy boy, what did you think? Yeah, this might have been my favorite uh, match of the entire show. I think that, like, I'm giving it an A minus. I think that both guys, judge them by their cover, they're the kind of people that if we saw them in AEW it would annoy us and it still will if they get signed to AEW. Um, you know, we feel bad for judging these guys based off the, co- uh, you know, off of their cover based on just how they look, their size. But the truth is if we're going to do it for guys like Kip Sabian and AEW, we have to apply that across the board. Uh, these guys are undersized as professional wrestlers. However, they each have a distinct character they have a distinct identity. They aren't out there pretending that they're going to beat Undertaker and kick out of three of his tombstone pile drivers um, to, to dethrone him. So, you know, I thought they did a good job. This match really got me more into it and invested in these characters as it went along. I thought that this was the best example on the show of kind of that take the audience on a ride mindset of wrestling where there was ups and downs and you know stakes on the match they kind of built their way towards different things providing the anticipation for the audience to go oh fuck that looks dangerous what's that going to end up being um so yeah this match really impressed me i'd be looking forward to you know seeing more of what both of these guys do you know, hopefully outside of a death match setting. I'm curious to see what they would do under normal rules uh, in wrestling. No fucking worries, bro. Uh, coming up next was, I guess, for me and you, the low light of the show, uh, DCW Extreme Title Scramble. Uh, it's AJ Gray, the Extreme Champion, taking on Nick Wayne, Yoya, Jordan Oliver, Lindsay Snow, Sawyer Wreck, and A... Oh, sorry, no, I already said AJ Gray. <laughs> um, fuck. Yeah, okay, bro. Um, obviously, they needed a little something, something to break up the proceedings a little bit here. I would have done something much different than this. What did you think? I would have actually just done a singles match between the two females in the match, between, uh, between Sawyer and what was the other lady's name? Lindsay Snow. Sawyer and Snow, I would have just had a singles match between them. Here's the problem. This exa- this whole Here's what match pissed here, me off. Hang on. Hang on, man. Hang on. I'm making <laughs> a point here. This scramble match here exemplifies an issue that's going on with modern wrestling across the board in that you've got six competitors in this match. Number one, six is way too many for this kind of matchup. 
Uh, it was just too cluttered, too busy the whole time. Number two, you have four undersized, uh, very babyish looking, backyard looking, untrained looking wrestlers wearing their gear that looks like they bought it off of E Lucha. And then you have these two female performers that have been stuck in the match with them. They look like they're ready to go up to TV on WWE or Impact or something like that. They look tremendous. They've got the look, the size, the the appeal that they would need to be great female performers in the industry. Unfortunately, the problem is the wrestling business is oversaturated both with men and women because there's only so many slots that are open for women on the, the big stage. And it seems like there's even less of those slots available for men that want to break in on a, in a serious way. And honestly, it's mean of me, but with the exception of Sawyer and Snow, there's nothing special about the rest of these guys that, you know, I think that they're needed in the wrestling business. It's just another bunch of guys wearing a pair of tights that look like they've never been in a gym that don't really look like they know how to do much beyond the basics. And they shouldn't be in a situation like this where they're having to hold together this six person match. They barely look like they're able to wrestle singles matches. It's honestly, I know it's sounding asshole but, there's a huge problem with all these kids that look like they just grew up playing the wrestling video games. And that's what they aspire to be. They aspire to be their own little creator superstar of themselves and, you know, go on these independent shows and pretend to be wrestlers. Um, there's no star power, no magnetism. You know, this look more like something you'd shove on the pre-show to give your trainees uh, you know, a bit of a spotlight, not like something you'd stick actually on the show on Fight TV. Uh, so yeah, F F rating. Unfortunately, uh, I wish everyone involved in it the best. I hope that the guys can prove me wrong, and I hope that there's more in the future of the ladies in this match. Very good, bro. Uh, so yeah, when I saw that this was going to be a multi-person match, I was like, ah. Uh... I think they do these scramble matches quite often in GCW. That's that's something that I, has been alluded to me by a friend of mine. Um, the only part I liked of the match was the beginning when AJ Gray beat the fuck out of everyone early on and just yoked all of them one after another because it seemed realistic that the big guy would fucking wouldn't take long for him to fucking yock all of them and and they spill to the outside. From there, this is where it went downhill. Um, it is just choreographed fake mm -hmm. wrestling. Uh, I was not into it because it's too stupid with the clear choreography and the clear, uh, they're helping each other. You can see that they're cooperating with yeah. each other out there. They're, 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 they're not selling with their face because they're busy thinking of the next spots. We talk about this all the fucking time. Um, of course, there was a dive spot into a bunch of people on the outside because every multi-person match has to have a dive to the outside on a bunch of people yeah. that kind of catch them. Fucking catch the people properly, please. Uh, uh, another well, note I mean, I you, you, you remember your time in pro wrestling. It kind of sucks taking them dives, bro. Like, well, you know, don't don't suggest doing it in the first place if you're not prepared to catch the fucker. Um, <laughs> Uh, another note I wrote, all fake shit. Like, I don't even know what I'm re referencing there. I'm just getting annoyed as the match is wearing on. Um, Lindsay Snow was a little rough out there. She was a little, she made a couple of mistakes. And uh, there were there were a couple of times in the match where I felt like, uh, I don't think a lot of these people know how to think on their feet, think on their toes if something doesn't quite go right, or if they've kind of forgotten something. Um, and that's, that's a real pet peeve of mine. I would love to see these people get told to go out there and and uh, call it in the ring. Let's see how that fucker works out for them because if this is if this is how they think that they need to be in order to succeed in wrestling, I, I really, really think it's a, it's a bad road to go down to be so um, concerned with choreographing every fucking second of every fucking match. 
Another point in case Nick Wayne missed a swanton, clearly missed, and just totally no sold it because he was supposed to supposed to hit it, and he got straight up and he did whatever he had to do to try and cover it up, I suppose. But it's just shit like that. I, I hated the match and, and the finish with uh, AJ Gray with that fucking sloppy super bomb off the top rope, dude. You need to have both your feet on the top rope when you utilize a super bomb off the top. I've seen Chris Candido do it. If not, one foot on one rope and one foot behind you on the t- turnbuckle with the guy who bent over with his legs spread on both ropes so that you can actually fucking hit the fucking power bomb properly without looking like you're going to kill yourself in the process. Just if you're going to do that move, just look at Chris Candido and how he did it all those yeah. fucking times. Just watch or just it. Just don't do shit that you can't do properly. Exactly. Because right. I think this this is the kind of shit that happened at the last G, the G, GCW show, uh, The World on GCW. I think AJ Gray did something in that match that completely fucked up as well. Trying to do things that he's probably not capable of. Um, I think the guy's got promise, but I um, haven't been impressed so far. Anyway, uh, let's move forward, bro. Uh, the ring announcer was on his phone in the ring on camera during Matt Tremont's entrance. Fucking hell. I get it. You guys are the casual. You're like, we don't give a fuck, man. But <laughs> come don't on. Be that don't casual. Don't, 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 yeah, don't be that casual. At least keep the skeleton of a wrestling event there because otherwise you're just giving ammunition to people that hate this genre of pro wrestling that are just saying, well, this is no better than a backyard wrestling event because I've literally been involved in backyard wrestling events that were more professionally run than some of the things that we would see on this. Like, yeah. I've had ring announcers in backyard wrestling events that actually wore a suit and had notes, you know, before the show on who everybody was that looked more professional than this guy. And this is actually a professional, real deal promotion that's on yeah, cunt. pay-per-view right now that's it bro uh okay we're getting to our semi-finals the bulldozer yeah, Matt Tremont yeah. taking on Toru yeah. Segura um I don't have many notes here but I think that this was my personal favorite match of the show I know you preferred uh the one with what's his name and who's his face Drew Parker and Cole Radrick sorry everyone <laughs> Been a long day. I had to sit through NXT as well. So give me a break. I didn't. I'm just I'm just lazy. I'm just yeah. lazy. I know. Um, this is my favorite match of the show. Uh, I love the start of the carpet strips. <laughs> carpet strips. <laughs> uh Segura avoiding the barbed wire by jumping and up and leaping onto the top rope with a fucking sick crossbody. That was very cool. Um, I did remark in my notes how many cannonballs do we have to see? Although he did do one in his previous match. So that's okay. It's one of his moves, but that means fucking, oh, what's his name? Radrick should not have done one at all. He should have thought of something else. But maybe they both do the move and I don't know shit. Maybe that's just uh, a coincidence. Anyway, um, they're both, their heads are just piercing out with blood, man. Um, And the the back and forth headbutts really were uh, something to... uh, be quite impressed by, especially when they have those fucking things jammed into their skull at the same time. These guys are fucking nuts, man. Um, Tremont hitting that lariat into the light tubes felt very close to being a finish. It was a nice false finish for me. Uh, He hit the Death Valley driver to get the win. I was glad because at this point, I still wanted him to win. I wanted him to have another accolade on his list of deathmatch tournament victories. Juicy boy, your turn. Matt Tremont and the one and only Toru Segura. Yeah, I'd give this a, a, a C plus. I think, you know, Segura is, is great. I'd like to see more from him. I thought that he had a lot of charisma. I thought that once again, it's a true pro in that he knows who he is. He knows what his role is in the context of the show. And he goes out there and does it. Um, You alluded to it in your own notes. Yes, I felt like the clothesline into the light tubes that was the false finish. To me, that should have been ball game finish of the match. Not because the Death Valley driver is not a, a great looking move for Mr. Tremont, but because the 
very often in deathmatch wrestling, we see spots where a, you know, a person will set up a light tube over one of their opponents, and then they'll try to do a diving move onto their opponent so that they smash the light tubes in between, or they'll try and set the, 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 the glass up in a certain way so that they can do a move into the glass, into their opponent, et cetera, et cetera. And oftentimes the light tube moves or it rolls out of the way or it just slides out of position due to the just the movement going on in the ring of the performers running through it or whatever they might be doing to execute the spot. And to me, this clothesline into the light tubes moment is as about as perfect as you can get as far as pulling off pristine, well-executed deathmatch high spots. There's an art to it. There's a talent to it that doesn't get appreciated. We saw it here. There was no holes in the logic of this maneuver, which is why I'm focusing on it. Because to me, it's going to be one of the kind of like the snapshots of this event that I walk away with as a fan thinking of that's going to get me excited for the next event of this nature from GCW. Because if you notice, uh, Segura actually went to use the, the, the light tube. Tremont manages to catch it, throws it back at Segura before he knows what's happening. Uh, you know, Tremont's arm has already swung in like a sledgehammer. Boom! Smashed the fucking light tubes. Perfectly timed bump. The sound that the clothesline impacting and the light tube smashing made was perfect. Uh, you know, it, it went off just completely without a hitch and it had a lot of high impact to it, visually spectacular. Um, and so that's why for me, that this is an example of a match that kind of uh, burned a little too, little too long for my liking. Uh, it was a good finish what they did, but I think that they could have really uh, ended up with a classic on their hands had they chosen to actually finish it off after that clothesline. So for anyone else out there that wants to say deathmatch wrestling is garbage or bullshit, go back and watch this match for an example of why you're full of shit. All right, let's go. <laughs> yeah, bro. Um, good shit, bro. Uh, moving forward. We've got uh, the other semi-final, brother. Uh, Drew Parker takes on Rina Yamashita. Your thoughts? Yeah, I wasn't as bothered by the fact that this was an intergender match in this case because uh, Yamashita is obviously, you know, tough. Um, and also, physically speaking, she matched up a lot better with her male opponent here. However... I still don't like intergender matches unless it's done as part of an angle where they're making a special point of saying, oh my God, there's a poor woman and woman in the ring with this male wrestler. He's going to beat the shit out of her. Like, because I just believe in having those weight divisions and those, those, those separations between the divisions. Um, however, I thought that once again, uh, both these two, really worked quite well together. I think that um, regardless of my personal opinion, it's obvious that the fans really enjoyed having her there. And it was clear that she knew how to get in there and work these matches. Um, she took as many crazy bumps as anyone else on this event here tonight. And, um, you know, yeah, like I, again, you know, I thought this turned out to be a, a begrudgingly, I have to admit that I thought that this ended up being a good match. Um, and I'm probably going to give it a C minus. Very good, bro. Uh, yeah, I didn't mind this one either. Uh, I, I, I like some of the spots, her biting Drew's wound on the outside of his bandage and the look in his face was like, what the fuck? How, how sick are you, cunt? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, her going face first into the pain of blast was awesome as well. The darts... Rear their ugly head again. I forgot to mention that in his previous match. I thought throwing the dart into the wound on the back of, uh, what's his name again? Radrick was disgusting, but fantastic as well. Um, superplex through the glass. Great shit. Um, one thing that we're both very critical of, and I, I think you might have already mentioned it, was people hitting themselves over the head with the tube. 
Um, it's just if it, if you're gonna sell it when someone else does it, but then you just hit yourself in the head really hard with it and do nothing, and it psychs you up. Eh, What's the point? What's the point? Um, I thought the superfly splash that she did onto Drew with the tubes might have been the finish, and I was about to uh, throw my drink because I didn't want her to win. No, I really wanted Drew to go through uh, to the final. Um, Swanton through the glass. It's over. What a great finish to the match. Moving forward, getting close here to the end of this review, Juicy Boy, but we had a little segment which uh, took place in the ring with uh, a bunch of guys who are going to be inducted into the Deathmatch Hall of Fame. Madman Pondo, my good friend, and you can find my exclusive interview with him on the Insider's Edge podcast on the WCWA Network. Toby Klein, of course, as well. Wife Beater was out there, uh, and Pondo got on the mic, just threw out some, uh, you know, kind words and and thoughts and uh, respect to uh, some people who have passed away over the years, uh, obviously recently Tarzan Goto, uh, but also uh, other deathmatch legends, Mr. Pogo, um, Colt 45, Brain Damage, Nate Hatred, Marcus Crane, Danny Havoc, uh, amongst a few others. Yeah. Um, John Wayne Murdoch interrupts. And uh, I, I thought that the deathmatch, <laughs> I thought all of them were going to like team up on him or something and beat him up. But that's such like a, I don't know, like a WWE segment with like a Heath Slater or something like that. Um, but Alex Cologne interrupts, which that was so sick seeing wife beat him, <laughs> laying the fuck out. Um, what did you think of this little segment here, bro? It seemed a little random, but um, it was cool to see the uh, death match. Um, I, I, I thought it was really classy to, to uh, actually introduce him. And, uh, you know, I liked the way that the audience kind of even if they didn't personally know who all these people were, they gave every all of these guys a pop uh, because, you know, they did pave the way for this kind of wrestling in the social media era is a lot more accepted by people that are my age and younger, like kind of our age and younger than. Um, and in large part, these guys are responsible for the, you know, the road being paved. When these guys were at the height of their careers as independent wrestlers, uh, there was a lot of hatred and derision uh, within the wider wrestling community slung their way. Um, whereas these days we think of deathmatch wrestling as being more of a subgenre of standard American professional wrestling. Um, very classy move, I thought, to acknowledge the, the guys that had passed away. Um, all of those guys that he listed in that little speech died way before their time. I don't think that there was a single person in that list, with the possible exception of Tarzan Goto, that actually passed away before the age of 50. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very sad. It was really nice to see. Like those guys never lived. They, they would still be young enough if they were still alive to be performing today. But unfortunately, they, they did not live to sort of get to enjoy the prominence that deathmatch wrestling is now experiencing. Me personally, if the, the, this, the interference by the guy was another example of GCW doing something cool and then shooting themselves in the foot with it because it's this casual approach that they sometimes take sometimes seems to border bro on the going from being casual to just, ah, oh, we don't give a fuck. Just go out there and be a bit of a heel and tell them that they're full of shit. And then wife beetle will hit you with a spine buster and they'll kind of kick you out of the ring. And then Alex Cologne will come out and say some baby face shit about the cage match that's coming up. And it really felt like that was the amount of thought that was put into this. Um, you know, Really, everyone with the exception of Wife Beater should have either been powdered out with a shot to the face by Murdoch or they should have exited the ring on their own accord before that point so that the ring would be empty and clear of all that humanity so that everyone could see Wife Beater nail that spine buster. I think it would have been a much bigger moment. I think it would have been a highlight moment that they could use. Um, and in general, I think that what should have happened 
if they were really going to do this right, was that Murdoch, as the current deathmatch wrestler um, and someone that's prominent at the moment on GCW show, uh, I would have had him knock out Mondo and, and uh, you know, the other guys. I would have left only Wife Beater standing in the ring. Wife Beater manages to hit the Spine Buster, but uh, fucking Murdoch then, you know, hits a rake to the eyes or something gets back on top of wife beater, gets some heat on him. Then Alex Cologne could have come out and made the save. But as it was, this thing just, the way that they laid it out, it was just cluttered and a bit all over the place. But props to Mondo for his speech. I really thought that was heartfelt and touching. And uh, it didn't actually outstay its welcome. Even though when I went into it, I was kind of like, oh, let's just get to the end. But by the end of it, I was like, no, that was a classy thing. I like the fact that these guys are getting a little recognition that have passed on. Very cool, bro. Very cool. Uh, Well, it's it's time to now hit up our main event of the evening. Uh, It is the bulldozer, Matt Tremont, uh, against the death match prince, Drew Parker. Again, bro, take it away. Your thoughts on the finals of Tournament of Survival 7? Well, bro, I mean, I'm sort of, I'm a fan of Matt Tremont, obviously. I kind of became a fan of of his opponent, of Drew, throughout this event. Um, But I have to say, man, this match left a lot to be desired for me, for most of it. Um, The crowd was sitting on their hands, kind of in a, you know, we've seen that type of thing. Uh, you know, they just kind of rehashed a lot of the uh, filler stuff that we've seen all throughout the rest of the event. I mean, obviously, when you get to the finals of a tournament, let alone a deathmatch wrestling tournament, it's kind of going to be a matter of, well, what do we do now? They've already seen us perform previously, and now, you know, they've already seen all the other matches have all this other shit involved in them. So what are we going to do to keep it interesting? I think that for a large part, the crowd was sitting on their hands. However, this match is actually getting a C plus because it is, it's not directly comparable, but it's one of those matches that's like Mankind versus Undertaker Hell in a Cell, where like, even if the surrounding match wasn't great, uh, there's just some things in it, some intangible qualities in it that make it um special and for me that that was the finish of this match a scaffolding was set up uh outside the ring uh obviously both guys eventually made their way up to it it was just then a matter of which one's taken the bump uh so i'll let carl go into it in more detail but by this point uh that the two of them got up on the scaffold drew had one of those darts that he brought in stuck through his cheek uh at a certain point when they're battling up atop the scaffold he takes the dart out of his own bleeding cheek sticks it into matt tremont's head throws that fat fucker off of the scaffolding matt tremont takes a hell of a bump one of the best bumps i've seen in a long time especially from a guy of that size amazing 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 bump great visual he landed it perfectly in the middle of the ring. All the shards of glass that were on the mat went vroom, under, obviously, the impact. Perfect. And then the cherry on top to that amazing bump that Mr. Tremont treated us to. Drew gets up there. The kid's got a hell of a scent on bomb. I like the fact that he distinctly does it in his own way. He doesn't try to emulate Jeff Hardy or anything like that. And, uh, you know... Boom, all the way down off the top of that scaffolding with the scent on bomb. Uh, I thought that was going to be the finish. That was kind of an iconic moment for the match. And that sequence is what is giving it its C plus rating. However, the finish itself uh, ended up being quite anticlimactic. I can hardly even remember what it was, but it left me with a bit of a a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. I'll say it that way. I get that the idea behind it was probably like, oh, they've already thrown everything at each other and now it's just they can hardly breathe anymore. So it's just going to come down to who has the most stamina. 
uh, and he's just kind of managed to, Drew's just kind of managed to pull out the win of Matt Tremont here. Uh, but it just felt flat for me. I think that if you were going to have Drew end up winning the way that they did, then that sent on off the scaffold should be in the finish. Um, but that's, that's just me personally. Maybe you feel different. I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, I'll get to it when I get to it. Uh, really happy to see Nick Mondo out there, my good friend. You can see my exclusive interview with Nick Mondo on the Insider's Edge podcast yeah. on the WWE Network. Um, but yeah, this matchup right here, the Bulldozer, Matt Tremont, a very good friend of mine. You can see my exclusive interview with him on the Insider's Edge podcast on the WCWA Network uh, against Drew Parker. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, at this point, I'm getting over the headbutts into yeah. the light tubes. He's saying it so many times. I just, I just don't think it has an effect anymore after a while. And, and speaking of the light tubes, after a while, it kind of, uh, you know... <laughs> The novelty kind of wears off a little bit. Um, uh, it is what it is. That this is not the this is what death matches are known for. You know, light tubes, I suppose. But it would have been nice to get through one match that, without them. And you know, I, it's why I kind of like uh, when uh, you know the tournament of death. Every match has a different type of death match stipulation, whereas this is just it's just all death matches. But that's just me. Um, the dart through the face was fucked. Um, absolutely fucked, disgusting, loved it. Uh, I could tell everyone in the crowd was pretty hot with their fans. Uh, and I can, you could just tell that that room would stink like fat nerd stench. Um, yeah, there were a lot of neck beards in the audience, you know, I could definitely spot that. Right. Absolutely. Um, the scaffold, wasn't it funny that we thought that the scaffold was this the small little scaffold nicely stacked in the ring. It was just like it, an it's illusion. Like the perspective, <laughs> like a camera yeah. trick almost. Like at one yeah. point, Carl and I thought that the, the, the scaffolding was actually set up in the ring, which they often do for scaffold matches. And then it wasn't until like probably about after about seven or eight minutes of this scaffolding being on screen that the camera actually panned around to the point where we could see that the scaffolding was set up outside the ring. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we had no idea up until then because the ropes had been removed and replaced with the barbed wire. It kind of tricked you. It was a trick of perspective. And yeah. we sort of were tickled at how fucking stupid we were. But anyway. <laughs> well, um, while they set up this little baby scaffold in the ring, it's so stupid. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, they climbed to the top of this fucking scaffold, the dart into Matt Tremont's horn on his head, that, that fucking thing he's got right <laughs> yeah. there. That was fucking yeah. disgusting. Again, as you said, the, the bump off the scaffold was amazing. I think they should have done some spots before this, which were, which would be considered, uh, impressive before getting to the, the scaffold, because I think with Matt being thrown off that, Followed by the Swanton, I agree. It should have been the finish of the match because I thought it was, again, anticlimactic that mm -hmm. uh, that Drew won the way he did, which I think was just like a running knee whilst Tremont was holding on. Yeah, that, that V-trigger style knee that we love so much. Like, I you know, hate it, bro. I fucking hate it. It's but anyway, Carl's, it's Carl's favorite move. Deathmatch Prince, Drew Parker. The Welshman himself, by way of Japan, wins Tournament of Survival 7. Juicy Boy, what are your final thoughts and what is your final rating? Yeah, fuck, man. Look, I continue to be a fan of GCW in spite of itself. It's kind of like that little engine that could. There's things that happen on it all the time that annoy me, but they annoy me in a different way to how AEW annoys me. <laughs> like... At least in GCW, they know what they want to be and they know that they're a work in progress getting there. They don't already think of themselves as the top wrestling company in the world as AEW does. So that's mm. maybe why I don't find them as annoying. But anyway, um, I am looking forward to the next GCW show, although I hope they continue to refine things as we go along with these uh, special events on Fight TV from GCW. Um, I know they responded to criticism that, uh, from the last couple that were there. Um, 
and they've implemented changes to the production of each event as we've gone along. Want to shout them out for that. Overall, I'm going to give this event a 6.5 out of 10. Uh, it was enough to keep me entertained, but it's probably not an event that I'm going to go back and watch again in the future um, as compared to a different tournament we've covered, such as the Crockett Cup or something like that. Yep, good call, bro. I will give this a 7 out of 10. I really enjoyed the show. Uh, I felt that the show was more entertaining for me personally than uh, NXT In Your House, which I believe I gave a 6.5 today. Um, but yeah, just it, nice to see something a little bit different, a little bit of a different flavor, uh, and to start to really, uh, you know, sink my teeth into this whole uh, deathmatch scene going on right now and uh, learn a little bit more about it. So, uh, Juicy Boy, thank you again. Yeah, no fucking worries, Con. Thank all of you out there. That's right, all of yeah. you for checking out our yeah. review here thank you. on the WZWA network of GCW's Tournament of Survival 7. I'm California. This is Juicy Boy. And we will see you down the fucking road. Network, that's the way we play. Good God Almighty. Network, that's the way we play. All of us has been paid for by the WZWA Network.